So, welcome. Thanks for agreeing to, well, welcome back, Graham. <laughs> Um, to kick start, I would like to introduce you briefly to the audience so uh, they know a little bit more about you. So, can you hear me? Yes, because I've been touching my mic for the last half hour. <laughs> Jane, you are a product director at Intercom in London uh, with a big track record for launching products and leading product teams. Uh, previously, you were at Moonpig, not in this order, but Canon, Tesco, and you had a very varied career. I'm not going to spoil it too much because you're going to tell us a bit about that in a second. Bob uh, Vickers, Product Director at Lend Invest. I know you, your whole team is here, so you need to be careful about what you say. Um, yeah, Lend Invest, the marketplace for property finance. And before product management, you were at Tesco Online in operations. That's where you got introduced to uh, product management before it was a thing, or before you, you knew it was a thing. Uh, and you were also uh, at Just Eat, just before that, right? Graham, you've been introduced, but I'm going to do that again. CPO at Catapult, a flexible workforce platform. Um, before that, you spent three years at Deliveroo, working on all kinds of products, B2B, internal tooling, AI systems, a lot of stuff. Uh, and before that, uh, you told me that you became, or well, the first role that you had in product was a TransferWise, and you got it through becoming a receptionist, uh, and then talking your way into building a, an app yourself, and then getting into, and then convincing TransferWise to give you a job in product. So, pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to say that because I think that just giving your kind of like one minute bio, and I don't do it justice, really highlights the fact that no two product careers are the same. So to kick off, I'd like to ask uh, you a question on how has your previous experience before products um, impacted the way you think about your career? Jane, you want to start? Yeah, so, um, so I've had a very career, as Matilda said. Um, I was one of these really lucky teenagers at the age of 18, I knew exactly what I wanted to be and um, I spent the whole of my school, later school life very convinced on my career for life choice and that's why I'm sitting here today in front of you all in my nurse's uniform <laughs> and uh, I know everything there is to know about the intricacies of the human body and my bedside matter, matter is second to none, I can assure you of that. Um, so no, I'm definitely the poster child for the four or five careers that we're meant to have in our lifetime and I, I don't, I've lost count of which one I'm on now, but I went from nursing into um, working at Reuters as a TV new, news journalist where I went in very similar right at the bottom of the rung and um, was working as a TV news journalist in the field for more than eight years. I then moved into digital editorial content at TV stations, so Channel 4, ITV, UK TV, moved sideways into product while I was there, and then moved fully into product um, in the e-commerce space, so Tesco, Moonpig Canon, and I'm now in the B2B space um, at, with uh, Intercom. So really varied career, um, and when I look back and I think about what's shaped shaped me. I think there are a few things that I, in the way I approach my career, in the way I approach my role, that have come from those experiences. And so one of them is definitely about value. So I've definitely got guilt about leaving the NHS. Um, and that has driven everything I've done since. So I'm constantly looking for the fastest way for me to be delivering value for customers. Um, and so that's a real driver on the types of roles I pick. So I'm constantly looking for roles where I can see there's a very broad impact or where I think I can start delivering value very quickly. Um, secondly, I'm obsessed with speed. So um, working as a nurse, obviously you're in life, death situations a lot of the time and you need to make decisions really quickly. So I want to be in a place that's fast and feels, like, feels decisive and where I'm not having to talk to all the departments that were listed up there for BMW. I want to be somewhere where I can move quickly and, um, and be operating at speed. Um, I'm also constantly thinking about my journalism career, so the ability to synthesize information quickly and tell stories. Um, I think product managers have to be excellent storytellers, so I loved all the talks this morning on that because we need to be able to get in, gain buy-in quick, quickly about the choices we're making. Um, uh, the resource that we're spending is very thin, so we need to be able to tell stories about why we think we're spending that resource wisely. Um, so storytelling is a strong thread. And then finally, I think, because I've moved around so much and I've 
thrown myself into different situations where I've been completely out of my depth, um, I am more resilient. Um, and that does help me with some of the challenges that Susanna was just talking about, where you're facing situations where you're not the expert, you don't know what you're doing, you, um, you don't know where to go next, your customers are moving around, the industry is changing. Um, and I think by having moved around so much, I'm slightly more well equipped to deal with those sorts of, um, that sort of ambiguity. Right. So resilience and anything, uh, I will turn to, to Bob now, any other skills that helped you in retrospect uh, lead you where you are now? Yes, absolutely. So I haven't had the sort of varied career Jane has had, but I think having kind of a leadership mindset has really helped me get me to where I am today. So I don't mean being the CEO of the product or anything like that. I mean more in respect to whenever my career has progressed and gone positively, it's actually been because I've been just delivering effectively and quickly. And for the organization I was in at the time, it meant we were delivering value, I was communicating well, I was getting on well with the stakeholders, rather than being, I should be getting promoted now. So I've kind of, the times it's gone really well, the times when I've actually just been doing a really good job. And unless you're kind of leading your product and delivering that value, you know, you're not gonna progress your career. You know, it's quite straightforward, I think. The, the other side of it is, I've always found people, especially in the product and the tech space, they wanna work with people who come up with solutions to problems, not just problems. So as kind of in a leadership position now, it's much more effective when people come up to me and say, hey, we've got this problem, but I've got this solution over here, what do you think? Because mm -hmm. it kind of shortcuts a lot of stuff. And I think one of the ways I progressed at Lendinverse was we were changing our platform due to some regulatory reasons. And people were talking about how we had to build a new platform. And actually kind of myself and the team worked out with a simple change to the user flow, we could deliver what we needed. And what that meant is we delivered value, we got on with it, but also the executives, who, you know, they're the people who can sort of make or break your career a bit, they saw me doing an effective job, so they're more likely to kind of put me forward for something. So just taking the lead, I think, good, is important. Good advice in there. Uh, my next question is more around, I guess, challenges, because we've heard Susanna give her own personal retrospective of the things she's dealt with uh, navigating her, her product career. Graham, any challenges or things that you have to come to terms with to, to grow in your, in your leadership role as a product person? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> the one thing for me is similar to what Susanna was talking about is uh, you can constantly feel like there's so much to learn that it, uh, like you're never good enough. You're never gonna know enough about your customers or everything you want to. You're never gonna know enough about the industry. You're never gonna know, uh, and as soon as you get good at product management, then you've got these whole leadership skills to, to work on and improve, which is entirely different. So I think that, that was probably the biggest challenge for me, and the way that I've <clears throat> kept myself sane through that is uh, just by learning to love learning, just by working out a routine and a way of approaching problems that, uh, that help me through. So for me, it's audiobooks and meeting people and asking them in person like how they solve these, these, these questions, these problems. That's what's kept me uh, mm -hmm. sane. I would like to stay a little bit further on this uh, question of challenges, because I think it's quite interesting in retrospect what we... Jane, do you have any, anything, any challenge that you had to deal with to really you know, grow in your, in your role? And yeah. Um... When I was thinking about this question, I was thinking probably the biggest challenge that I've faced um, is a lack of, I, I mean, I don't want to switch off all the men in the room, but a lack of um, female leadership. So I've come up through product um, and through a lot of those careers that I mentioned at a time when female leadership has been sparse. And so um, there's lots of stats, particularly in our tech um, world that we're in where engineering, I think it's still only 13% of engineers are women, data science is only 15%, so there's a real lack of women, particularly as you get up the ladder, and I, th I think this role I'm in right now, it's my 22nd role, um, and I've never been managed by a woman, and I think that that's a staggering fact and a shocking fact, uh, and one that I hope that none of you have to go through, but it's meant that I've never had those really visible role models above me in the ladder, and, and they've done lots of studies, haven't they? Um, lots of research on how important role models are. So, with uh, 
at schools, the number of girls going into STEM subjects is nearly double if they've had a female science teacher. And uh, there was an interesting VR study that I, I read about recently where they, they gave um, men and women a talk to present, and the women who were sh and each of them were shown images of um, important leaders, world leaders, while they were talking. And the women who were given images of female, uh, important female leaders, uh, while they were talking, did a far better presentation. It didn't have any impact on the men doing the talks, um, but women, I think, because there's this sparsity, it's um, something that has definitely impacted me and it's stopped me from pushing myself as, as quickly as I think I could have done. So, for example, there was one point in my career where I found I was actually inputting the search term deputy to find the next role to apply for. Um, so it was less about the role I was looking for. I was hugely overqualified for some of the roles that were attracting me and it was because they had assistant or deputy in the title. Um, and I had to stop myself and push myself on. Um, things are changing and it's great, but we're still only a hundred years on from getting the vote. Um, but things are definitely changing and it won't be the same for all of you. Uh, but that's definitely something I've had to overcome. Ironically, I've now got a son who's at school and at every level, GCSE, A-level, uni now, girls are outperforming boys. So I think the world is about to change. Um, and he has the opposite problem ahead of him, but uh, that's definitely something that's, that's held me back, and I've had to find my, my way of being a leader. Um, there were obviously, uh, I'm talking too much probably, but there, there, were, there were strong women in nursing, but they were all sort of nurse ratchet figures from one flow over the cuckoo's nest, and they weren't women I'd ever want to emulate. So it's been hard for me to know how to be a leader um, and, and to find my style. Another thing I was wondering is, because obviously we've talked about this, there's no clear career path in products. What would be your advice for PMs who are maybe mid-careers and looking for their next role? Like, What would you recommend in terms of evaluating next career moves? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Bob, maybe? Yeah, yeah so, uh, so I can jump in with this one. So, so I'd say the, the most important thing to realize is that like, you can plan your careers. It doesn't mean that the plan you have is going to happen, but just by having a plan and understanding where you want to go will hopefully help you kind of develop the skills that you need in some areas and just increase the chances of something happening that, that is positive for you. So I, meet, I, I interview a lot of kind of product candidates and I'm always surprised at the number of answers that I get to, you know, why are you applying here? And it's, I want to improve my product skills. And that is a, a valid answer, but there's not much to it. Whereas I can think when I was leaving Tesco to go to Just Eat, I wanted to work in a smaller organization where things happen more quickly. I wanted to work somewhere where tech was central to how the business worked. And for personal reasons, I wanted a job in London, not in Welling Garden City. So I just had these very clear parameters. This is what I was searching for. And the exact same when I went from Just Eat to Lendinvest, it was all about, actually, I wanted to work in fintech, I wanted to go to a startup, and I wanted to try and find a fast-growing company. So I kind of had these very clear parameters which helped guide me through my career. And I think as you get more experience, you get a better kind of feeling of what's important to you. But it's, the first step is kind of realizing these things are there. The only other thing I'd add on, on top of that is if you can find a fast-growing company or fast-growing team within a larger company, anything like that, I would like jump in and join that company because they've probably got smart people there. And if it's growing quickly, inevitably you'll just get more opportunities. So yeah, that would be my, my key things. Graham, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, I, um, I've been quite lucky with a few companies where I've managed to, to find one that are fast-growing and that's definitely led to like, a lot more opportunities. So I can, I can definitely relate. One of the things I always struggle with is trying to identify which companies are going to be those fast growing ones, which are going to be like the, the, the ones that you just have to get to, uh, that you can't, can't let go. And the unfortunate truth that I've realized is that <clears throat> it's impossible to tell, but that's kind of liberating. Like I see it as a thing of saying, when you've got an opportunity or you're choosing between two or you're choosing to stay or to go, is to rather than say, I have to make the right call here, because it's impossible. If it were possible to, to work that out, that'd be like, uh, I was going to say a lot more rich VCs, but like, you know. Um, 
But uh, I, I find liberating to look at it as just a bet of saying, right. give the information I have right now, this call looks like the best one I can possibly make. Mm. And then you take the pressure off yourself about making the right decision. And I think um, the people that I, I look to to emulate those bets are investors, and they look at team, market size, and uh, unit economics. So I, I kind of mm. vet any company I'm thinking about joining through those three things. And if they broadly line up, I think that's as good a bet as you can make. Good way to, to look at it. Have you made any, any bad bets, any bad career choices, and what have you learned from it? Jane, do you have any? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I look at you, because I know you've had 20, yeah, 22 you've had, roles. I've made you've had different <laughs> roles, and I'm yeah. sure you've been um, through the, the highs and lows. For me, um, it's not necessarily been the role that's been wrong, but it's the company um, that where it's not been that aligned with, I mean, you mentioned small companies. I've worked in a couple of massive companies. We both worked at Tesco, uh, Canon, big companies. Um, and I've realized that that's not right for me. Um, I definitely need to be somewhere where you can move very quickly and um, big cog in a small, that, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just um, actually companies where the culture is a bit more around this fail fast mentality. Um, so for me, it's definitely about the culture, and I, I think some of the mistakes I've made where I've not been pointed enough when I've been interviewing to really understand the culture of the company before I've joined. So now I really take time to ask the company about their values, uh, how do they invest in people, what sort of reward and recognition programs do they have, what's the environment, how have they invested in the space, so, to, so, because for me, then I can understand whether or not they're pe putting people first rather than the profit for the uh, business or the, even the product first. I would prefer to be in an environment where you put the people first and then I think the other things will follow. So I'm much more um, strict with myself in the interview process to try and understand some of those things. Right. So asking that. questions to the company as well about their to values. To really understand some of those values. That makes me think there's a really nice tool uh, called Key Values, I recently found out, exactly about that. You set up what you care about, work-life balance, different ways of working, and they suggest questions to ask to your employers about or your future employers or companies you're interviewing with about their values, uh, key values, I think it's pretty interesting. So it's in the same line of that. Uh, great advice. Um, another question that I have is around product leadership, because you've all moved to a role where you lead a team, manage product people. I'm interested in this transition from just being a product manager to a manager of product managers. Was this, did you have any expectations, any cold shower expectations versus reality when you moved into your first um, leadership role? Um, Graham, yeah. Bob, anyone? Um, so it, it's something for me that I thought about for a very long time, uh, about if it's what I wanted to do. I did a lot of research, I read some books, like Radical Candor is a really good one. Um, the manager's path is great. And I spoke to people that were product leaders, and like 50% of them told me, don't really enjoy the managing part of it, mm. not really my thing. So I took that away and I was like, right, do I really want to do this? So when I did eventually start, I was very like, I was pretty aware of what it was going to be like, and the, the good bits and the bad bits. The thing that surprised me the most was probably how personal it is and like how different and unique every person is, as well as like their skills, their personal style, introvert, extrovert, whatever, just things like people's uh, motivations. I didn't manage this person, but I worked with someone at, at TransferWise who their goal in product management was to, uh, was to do it and save up enough money to get their, their professional pilot's license. And I think they're now, they're now flying with a big airline. And uh, it was this amazing person, and I just realized, it made me, made me realize that if you were to motivate that person or to, to try to, to work with them on a certain thing, uh, as a manager, their motivations would be entirely different to someone who wanted to get promoted and have this like 50 year product career. Yeah. So like that realization of how individual everyone is and how you need to treat them differently was like probably the biggest surprise for me that I wasn't expecting. That makes sense. Mm. Any other well, realization? I, well, I, I think I was a bit of the opposite, I just sort of went into it without any research. <laughs> and the thing I, I realized the same is that people are really complex. So the biggest kind of impact on, I would say, the performance of your team, your products or anything is actually kind of generally what's going on in people's lives, what they bring into work. And you've got to be sort of as a leader tuned into that and be able to help and support your team as much as you can and as much as is reasonable and even beyond if you, if you can. So I completely agree with that. The other thing I'd say is I consider 
sort of myself sit in my first leadership position. And what I'm finding, so I was expecting to sort of plan strategy and help the team grow and develop and work with the head of data and all those sorts of things. Um, but I've been surprised how much I still get pulled into the day-to-day -day and I'm backfilling a you know, product manager role at the moment and you're trying to hire. And it's just those leadership things I expected I'd be doing, I'm doing less of than, than I could ever believe. The balance between like, the nitty-gritty and the leading. And, and yeah, the and, and it's also a bit of a feeling of like guilt in terms of you know, you're so busy, am I supporting my team enough, mm. am I giving them enough? So it's just a, a lot to balance up in, mm. in, in that role. Um, okay, another question more around managing, not burnout, but stress or this uncertainty in this role. Like when you're in such a high pressure, you know, demanding role, leading a team, figuring, out, figuring things out as you go, how do you deal with that? Are any tips for, for leaders in the room who are dealing with those uh, issues and stay sane whilst uh, leading? <laughs> Well, okay, so I'll lead off. In terms, yeah. for me, I think the biggest thing is just trying to like, create your network. So when I was a product manager, I had a whole team of other product managers I could talk to about challenges, things going well, being you know, pissed off with my boss, whatever it might be. When you're leading the team, you sort of lose that peer network, but actually what you have are people who run other departments who will have similar challenges. And then also, one thing I just realized earlier when I bumped into my friend Diogo um, outside is he's leading a team at another company and I've just lost touch with him and actually you've got this network in sort of your personal life as well where you can talk through some of the yeah. issues. So that's kind of my big thing. Interesting. For me, um, it, it's probably more on like the, the IC PMing, the individual PMing rather than like the leadership stuff. But there are two things that jumped out as being, as being interesting. So one is uh, so I worked at Transwise with Carl for a few years and uh, then at Deliveroo and in both those companies it was like 24-7. There was always stuff happening, international companies, you know, UK goes to sleep, Australia and Singapore wake up uh, and it's a kind of constant thing and I lived on Slack. I'm sure lots of people here have the same kind of thing where like you're before going to bed quickly check Slack, see what's happening and it got really addictive and a liberating thing for me was uh, my wife bless her, made me delete the, the app from my phone and the desktop app from my, my laptop and said, right, like, let's try for a week or two not checking anything in the evenings. And it was really liberating to realize that nothing relied on me watching it. Like, it's, like, it's like detox. Yeah. Are you recommending that. And like, it's almost this weird, like, retrospect, it's, it almost feels like an arrogance looking back going, I have to watch this. If something went wrong, I can't help. I'm not going to product my manage my way out of an incident. Yeah. I think it's um, a good sign as well that you, you set the foundations and that the show can run without you being too, yeah. too on it and pulling the strings as well, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, so that meant I could get back to my, my you know, normal Saturday night of relaxing, maxing, chilling, watching the basketball. Um, and I could just like, leave that whole slack thing behind. And the other thing is, uh, there's a really great book, by the way, called Thinking in Bets. I spoke a bit about like, placing bets and stuff. And uh, again, like, the, big, the big products like Instagram were here, Transpoise and Deliveroo I know firsthand. They look like fantastic products from the outside, but like Carl was saying, you ship stuff that is bad. You make so many mistakes. Like, to me, the good stuff uh, is outweighed by the bad stuff, like 10 to 1. There is so much stuff that you try and fail. No one sees all of the sketches you drew that are just terrible, terrible ideas. And so once like, I got into my head of, cool, any work we do, anything we try and present or try and ship is just a bet. And like the, the book, Thinking Best, talks about how poker players never actually look at, when they assess their performance, they never look at if the hand they, they chose or how they played it, if they won or not. They just look at, given the information I had at the time, was it the right call? So if a number comes up or like a, a certain card comes up and they lose, still the right decision to make to play that hand. Um, and so thinking about things like that really, really helped to take the stress off me, thinking like, cool, stuff's going to be wrong. That's entirely part of the game. All I need to do is to make sure that I learn from it. And I found that very liberating and just remove that layer of stress that was kind of always there. Interesting. Well, I don't want to, we have time for one more question, but I don't want to end on a stress, stressful <laughs> note. So let's end on a high note. What's, what keeps you going? What uh, excites you the most? What do you love most about the work you do? Uh, I want to ask you a quick answer from all of you, maybe 20 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. Jane, you want to? Um... I don't know whether it's the people in my team or the people who are the customers, but every time I speak to a customer or listen in on a customer interview, 
I come away really, really annoyed with all the things they hate about the product, but really excited about uh, how we can make things better. And then the people in the team, so my peers, my, uh, yeah, the, pe the people. people. It's not the product, it's the people. people. Like that. <laughs> uh, so I think for me, it's when like myself and previous roles or my team, that when we like, just deliver stuff that is effective and is just positive for customers, I, I just love the delivery side of it and releasing value. Uh, and, and for me, like, it, I hate to sound a bit Silicon Valley, um, <laughs> but like, it, it's not about like, make the world a better place, because I think everyone does that in their lives. It's like, if you can genuinely make a customer or a user's day better, like if you can save them half an hour and do something automatically for them, that's half an hour they get to spend with their kids or do something really nice. Yeah. If you, when we delivered food to people, it's really easy to think of us delivering food, but if you, I mean, if you don't, as I'm sure everyone here knows, like you get angry, hangry. Um, all of that, I know all of that, yeah. <laughs> But if you do, like you give someone a really nice meal and it's this really nice thing when you can have like, you can have a real world experience with someone uh, by making their lives better through a thing that you do that's essentially delivered by magic. Like technology is kind of magical. So yeah, to be able to like make people's lives better is like. That was really insightful. I think it's such a hard topic, right? Careers. Um, if you have any more questions for our speakers, we're gonna have a short break now, half an hour. You can come chat with them. Thank you so much. That was really great. I really had fun in this conversation. Thank you.